Hi guys, thanks for checking out the channel. In this video, we're gonna be installing a Wiesmann system boiler and prioritizing the domestic hot water. Let's just give you a quick overview of the job then. So this is a four bed detached house and we are currently installing the plant room of a full plumbing and heating installation. And uh, the customer has kindly stripped back the wall in the utility room, painted it all white. And as you can see, we've already made a start getting a pipe work on the wall. That's located with the Wall Raven Rapid Rail and the hammer fixing with rubber Euro line clips. Now, we acquired this job because we did actually do the neighbors four or five years ago and they kindly recommended us. Now, although the houses are actually um, a complete mirror image, we're not gonna be installing a plumbing and heating in the loft like we did in the neighbors. Now, I did actually film that job, so I'll put a link to that job at the end of this video, but in all honesty, I wouldn't recommend putting all this equipment up in your loft. You never know if you're gonna get a leak from any of the components and you could potentially cause a lot of damage in your house. So we advised, advised the customer on this one to actually put it all in the utility room on the ground floor. So we're a little bit tight for room, We've got a power tank going here because the water pressure in this area is really poor. So we've got a power tank, uh, dual cyclone air cylinder. We're gonna be doing domestic hot water priority. So this is a Wiesman 100 gas boiler and it's got the connections on the bottom to actually run a separate flow and return to the hot water cylinder, uh, which means we can prioritize the domestic hot water. We're not having any underfloor heating on this job. It's just two zones of radiator. So we are just gonna be using zone valves going to be um, utilizing the single system pump inside the boiler to do everything no need to over complicate it and yeah we're pretty much made a good start on it so yeah let me get some of the components in place and i'll show you how i'm going to be installing everything That is the central heating flow and return to the boiler pretty much in other than the filling loop. So let me just run you through what I've done so far. So underneath this Wiesmann 100 boiler, far left, that's the flow. So we've just come under there, tight to the boiler, and then we're straight into our zone valve. So we're gonna have two zones upstairs and downstairs for our central heating. Now, because we're pretty much doing an S plan on the central heating, we need to add the auto bypass. So no low loss header on this one. We have no need for it. We've got the rads running at the same temperature, no underfloor heating. So auto bypass straight into the return. So I've put that in after the two returns T in. So basically we've got this loop here that just goes round and round the boiler should it need it. And yeah, that's it really. So regarding the two zone valves, I've just separated them so you can get your spanners on to replace them if necessary. I have made it quite tight because we've got quite a lot going on here, not a lot of room. And then these two pipes here, these are just our return. So I'm just gonna add some isolation valves here in a second. Now coming back down on the return, I've just added the Addy Magna Clean Pro. So it's underneath the boiler. It's sort of far away enough that you can service it, take the magnet out, but I like to keep it as tight as I can underneath there. And then I've just added this additional remote expansion vessel. Um, so there is one inside the boiler, but it's not normally gonna be enough if you're adding you know, a lot of radius like we are on here. So I've just got a 12 liter expansion vessel. I'm gonna put a drain off on that. And then like I say, other than the filling loop, that's pretty much done. So the next thing we're gonna look at is the flow and return to the actual coil on the cylinder. Now this is where this boiler differs to a lot of other boilers. We've actually got a separate flow and return here on your system boiler. Now you can just cap them and use it as a standard system boiler, but we're gonna be doing hot water priority. So we're gonna utilize the fact that this boiler's got this incorporated into the design and pipe it straight into the coil on the cylinder. So what I'm gonna do is get this cylinder in location, work out which one's what, so I'm assuming it's just these two here. 
and then we're going to drop some pipes in and get the flower and turn piped up for the coil. Right, that is the majority of the pipe work done now underneath the boiler. So we've got our flow and return going into the cylinder and now I'm gonna move on to the hot and cold pipe work. So this cylinder is a little bit unique. It comes slightly pre-plumbed with our multifunctional valve already attached and our pressure and temperature relief valve already pre-piped with a ton dish, which is quite handy. Now, because I've pretty tight for space and I've got to get this power tank in, I've actually tucked the cylinder as tight as I can to this boiler which makes the multifunctional valve a little bit awkward, but it's still accessible for service and maintenance. But regarding pipe work, I'm gonna to have to bend some pipes round the back of the cylinder and then to pick up the existing pipes that I've already set up on the wall raven. So this is just your standard multifunctional valve, Kalefi. Uh, but this cylinder is a little bit unique. So this is called a dual cyclone air very similar to a Megaflow where you've got the air pocket in the top and a baffle, so you don't actually need to use uh, the possible water expansion vessel. It already comes with that expansion gap inside. So, right, let's get some pipe work behind it. Right, unfortunately the power tank hasn't turned up yet. So what we're gonna do is move on to the wiring. So with wiring centers, I usually use this one, which is the Salus wiring center. Now, in all honesty, the Salus controls, I don't particularly get along with, but this wiring center, I think, is the best one, mainly because it's pretty big. So some of these wiring centers you get, like the Honeywell ones, the Drayton ones, they're a bit small, whereas this one, you've got a bit more room to maneuver in. So it comes already pre-linked, but because what I'm doing isn't standard, I'm gonna to to remove all these red links here. Um, I'll keep the neutrals at the bottom and the earths at the top. But what I like to do is the permanent lives. I usually use one, two, three, and four, just so I know that that is all my permanent lives there. So I'll link those ones across. And your gray wire is permanently live. So, you need to make sure you get that in, otherwise the valve's not gonna work. So, what we'll do is the two gray wires, I'm gonna utilize one, two, three, and four as my permanent life. So as they're the first components in, we'll go straight into one. Next one, let's go straight up to earth, just get those out of the way. So, because these cables, live neutral and earth, are always going to pretty much be in the same location. It's best to get those out of the way first, I would say. What we've got left is the brown and the orange. So the browns are our um, switch, no, sorry, they are common into our two port, which would be the switch live from your programmable room thermostat on this instance. So they're going to be separate. Don't put those in together. But the orange is our switch live back to our boiler, so they will going together. Okay, and then our browns. So our browns are our uh, commons in, or switch loads, like I said, from our programmable room thermostat, so you wanna keep those separate. So these are the wireless programmable room thermostats I'm gonna be using. They are from EPH Controls, and this one is a CP4 version two, so very simple, easy to use, wireless programmable room stat. Because the hot water is on priority and they can actually control that via the boiler or via the app, I don't actually need a programmer that can do the hot water. So we've just got two separate individual uh, thermostats for each zone. And what we're gonna do is just wire in the wireless receivers. 
Okay, I've got both EPH receivers on the wall now and I've already pre-wired the live neutral and earth. So that leaves us with a gray and black wire from each receiver. Now, what I've done is I'm using the black wire for the common. Now, you could potentially link the live into the common on the receivers, but that won't allow you to turn the heating off via the boiler itself or via the smart app. So Beastman have an app which you can actually use as a master control. Although you won't be able to actually control the times you will be able to turn heating on and off so i need to make sure the common actually goes back to the sort of common out from the boiler itself and then we've got our gray wire so our gray wires are our switch life from our uh, receiver units now they need to go independently into each of our commons into our zone valve so basically our brown wire so our gray switch lives from our receiver units are going to feed independently the zone valve brown wire. So, so when I send my cable which is my switch live from my boiler I also need to send a common up as well. Now normally they're side by side on the PCB. We're inside the boiler now and I've just put the additional cable in for our switch live and our common up to our programmable room thermostats. Now the terminal that you need is number 96. Will that come up on camera? There you go, number 96. Now that is next to our live neutral enough. Now on this plug, it's gonna say live and then number one and then neutral. So live is your common out and then one is technically your switch live back. So in some boilers it will be uh, sort of marked down as SL or RT. You also have a neutral in there as well, which I'm not gonna use. So because I've used a free core, I've obviously got a blue cable, which I need to mark up. So we'll get a sleeve on that just to indicate that that's actually a live cable. Um, the issue really though, is the fact that I need to earth that cable that I've put in, but there's no spare earth terminals other than ones that require a spade. Now that's not sort of like the equipment that I would carry in all honesty. So I'm gonna to need to find a way of connecting that onto there really these men need to put a earth in a terminal block because you know if you're installing these and you haven't got a uh, merchants or any equipment on you to do that you're not actually going to be able to connect the earth up so you could potentially cut one of these cables and then way go it together which to be honest is what i might end up doing so uh moving over to the right hand side so this is our low uh voltage sort of section so this is where we're going to be putting our cylinder stats uh, our weather compensation sensor uh, you can also connect up your open firm here so on the actual wiring panel which i've just taken off you can see the terminal blocks here are actually all labeled up now i've had it before where Vismen have actually put the terminal blocking back to front and i was wondering uh, what was going on but if on the PCB you've got, I think it's X5. So X5 is a very furthest one. So this cable here, that is a plus bus cable and it should go into the block one. So if that's the case, if you follow that cable, you'll know that this terminal blocks are the right way around. Obviously you shouldn't have to do that, but I'm just sharing my experience in the past. Right, with these terminal blocks, you've got means of connecting four separate controls. So the ones we need are the hot water temperature sensor, which is three and four and then our weather compensation sensor, which is seven and eight. So I've just connected those up now. It's a little bit hard to see. Now, the domestic hot water temperature sensor is a 10K ohm sensor. So that drops straight into the cylinder pocket. So I've removed the cylinder stat that came with it. If I just pull it out, you'll see it's just a little file. So I use these uh, self-adhesive cable tie connections just to hold it in position so it's not really going anywhere unless someone actually pulls on it so in terms of wiring that is pretty much it we're just waiting on the electrician now to get the fuse spur in and hopefully the power tank's going to turn up and we can get it all plumbed in right moving swiftly on then the power tank has arrived and i have quickly plumbed it in so i've saved you more soldering montages so i'll explain that in a minute whilst we're on the electrics i'll just go through the eph controllers so up here is our wireless receivers so the boiler and everything is now on i've pressurized everything cleaned up all the pipe work so we're all good to go now these don't need any pairing they just pair straight up out of the box uh, very easy to use i really like these so like I said before, we've got one upstairs, one downstairs, 
and that is the receivers there. So at the moment, because I haven't completed the pie work to all the radiators, we've just isolated it all here, but I have filled up everything below that. So at the moment, the boiler is just heating up the cylinder on hot water priority. So um, the only way they can control that is via the app. So um, they'll scan this here, that'll download the app, then they'll link it with this QR code and then they'll be able to control the times for the hot water heat up. So the hot water is already nice and hot now. So let's move over to the power tank then. So um, this took about seven days to come in. So although apparently they are in stock, I don't seem to think that they are. They seem to take a very long time to get delivered. So that's something to bear in mind if you're gonna go down this option. Now this is 200 liters, so it matches the hot water cylinder. Obviously it's a lot smaller in size because this has got the insulation on it and also the baffle on the top. Now this is the variable speed pump. So this can do up to 80 liters per minute, I believe. And you can actually jack it all the way up to nine bar, although I wouldn't recommend that. Obviously we wanna go three bar. So I've just turned the pressure up there and you can see it will pre-charge the pipe work go into our water outlets. Um, but I've tried it, it's an absolute beast. It's, it's way better than the dab tank, I would say, in terms of the flow rate. So I've actually just been running on one bar and it's been absolutely brilliant. So let's just have a look inside. So I had to spin the pump around because the orientation that it came with on delivery was the pump was that way around, but the access to the ball valve and everything was this side. And that was gonna be a little bit awkward. So it's gonna be a little bit hard for you to see in here, but we've got a float valve there. We've got a submergible or submergible, submersible, what's the right word? A pump that's in the water down there. <laughs> so let's tighten that back up. Um, so this is a potable water tank. There you go. Spin that around, but I've still got the kitchen run off the main directly. Now something to bear in mind, the diameter of it, uh, it doesn't include this huge overflow connection on the side. <laughs> so uh, this, if you spin that round, just got a fly net in there. So yeah, it is quite large, that overflow. So that's something to consider. Luckily I had a bit of extra room. So I'll actually put it slightly on the curve anyway, because there's gonna be a door this side. Um, so when you buy it, it also comes with this brass T piece and then you get this potable water expansion vessel. So there's no bracket for this. I was gonna wall mount it, but it does screw straight into this um, fitting here. So that's an inch T. And then something to bear in mind with the pipe work, you're obviously gonna need some sort of bypass if ever this all fails. So what I've done is I've just branched off the cold fill here, got a bypass, which is off at the moment, obviously it's not being used and then non-return valve, and then that just links back into the pipe, which feeds the multifunctional valve for the cylinder. So yeah, that's pretty much it, it's pretty simple. So the overflow waste pipe size is 32 mil. You've got your standard 15 mil for your fill valve, and then it already comes pretty much assembled, I would say. So all you really gotta do is um, get the T on, get the expansion vessel on, and then pipe it up. Now, one thing to bear in mind when you first turn it on is I had an airlock in it and I had to crack the bottom nut, which is just under there. And then that sort of bled the air out of the system. And then as soon as that happened, you could hear it straight away, the pump kicked in. And uh, yeah, pressure went to all the taps. So yeah, really nice bit of kit, really, really powerful, almost too powerful, I would say. So um, yeah, slimline version, 200 liters to match the cylinder. And like I say, everything is now up and running. So. Regarding the rest of this job, I'm actually just gonna be running pipe work, getting all the central heating done. We're gonna start chasing the pipes into all the walls and we're also gonna hopefully take care of all the bathrooms for this customer. So anyway, thank you very much for watching this video. Hopefully catch you on the next one.